I'm Tony Preckwinkle, chair of the Cook County Democratic Party, and this is The 80, our podcast about the party, its candidates, and its leaders. We're beginning the podcast by interviewing our elected Democratic committee people to discuss their backgrounds and thoughts about the history and future of our party. Welcome, Senator Rob Martwick, who's also a committee person. Tell us a little bit about the district that you represent, the township that you represent, the ward that you represent in the uh, Democratic Party. Oh, good morning, and it's great to be here with you, Tony. Um, so as you mentioned, my name is Rob Martwick, and I currently serve as the state senator of the 10th district, which is uh, the northwest side of the city of Chicago, the, the far most northern, northwesternmost wards of the city of Chicago, um, including the 38th, 45th, 41st, uh, 39th wards, uh, a little bit of the 26th ward, and or excuse me, 29th ward, and then um, moving out into the suburbs, I have some of North Park Township, Leiden Township, Main Township, and Niles Township. So it's, you know, Senate districts are 225,000 people, so it's pretty big. Um, but in my role in the party, I serve as the committeeman, the Democratic committeeman of the 38th Ward, one of those wards there up on the Northwest side. Now, you represent, uh, as Senator, a district which uh, historically has kind of been Republican. So tell us about uh, tell us about how you flipped the district. Well, um, so many things over time have uh, you know uh, trended this way. I actually ran for um, a seat. It was obviously, the district line, lines were a little bit di different, but it was the same seat um, back in 1996, and um, then. Uh, held by what was then the assistant majority leader of the Republican Party in the Senate, um, a position he held that until they were able to actually, um, you know, that the area started to change and uh, uh, it was around 2000 when it was actually taken over by Democrats. But it remains, um, there are vestiges as, as people, um, young families from the inner city of the city of Chicago start to find that they can't afford in some of these gentrified neighborhoods homes. They've moved up to the Northwest side. So my district is, is very interesting because um, many of my city wards are a real contrast between the old um, conservative uh, uh, policemen, firemen, um, tradesmen, and these younger families, uh, teachers, more progressive minded, uh, liberal minded uh, voters that are moving out. Um, so it is a democratic area, but it, surprisingly for the city of Chicago, it, it's not what people think of in terms of a democratic majority in the city of Chicago. Okay, and the 38th Ward, which you serve as the representative of the Democratic Party, is part of your, of course, the Senate district. It is, and, and uh, you know, along those lines, the 38th Ward is, is kind of a snapshot of that because is the 38th Ward is, is uh, 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 I guess, short and wide from east to west. And on the eastern end of my district, uh, near the Portage Park area, uh, very, very high Democratic majorities. But as you move west, it starts to get more and more conservative, including some precincts where um, Donald Trump won in this last election uh, by two to one majority, 65, 68% of the vote in some of the western precincts of my ward. So again, I've got that conflict between those younger, more progressive voters and the old fashioned conservatives on the West. All right, now you've been in politics or associated with politicians for a long time. Tell us about your family. Well, uh, yeah, I was, you know, sort of raised in politics. My dad um, became, my dad actually ran for uh, the state legislature in 1968 um, and lost, um, and then became the Democratic committee in 1969. Uh, a position he held for 50 years as a Democratic committeeman in, in Cook County. And, um, you know, he was very proud of his service, never went on to hold a government office, uh, but really enjoyed being part of the party process and helping good qualified candidates uh, run for and win office. That was something that, that he really enjoyed. And growing up in that, it was something that uh, I really took to. I have four sisters and, and it didn't it didn't capture their imaginations, but it surely caught mine. And so, boy, I ran for student guy. I held student government uh, positions in literally every level of education, grammar school, high school, college, and law school. I was in student government. So it was something that I was always drawn to. And, and uh, when I got an opportunity in law school to run for um, a local township position in North Park Township, where my dad was 
this firm. Um, I ran and won and I served there. I wound up serving as a, a village trustee in the village of Norwich for 12 years. And then once I won this position, my wife and I decided to buy a home in the city of Chicago. We moved here and that's how I became the 38th Ward Democratic Committee. All right, now you went power from being a trustee into the house, right? I did, I went uh, in 2012, um, I ran for a vacant seat in the House of Representatives. I had a contested primary and I won that. And I served in that until um, 2019. It was uh, uh, June of 2019 when um, my Senator then uh, became a judge and his seat was open and I sought the appointment there and I was appointed. And so I've served for the last year and a half in, in the Illinois Senate. Well, you picked a really challenging time to, uh, <laughs> to, to be in the Senate or be in the state legislature at all. How has that gone? You know, it's, it's been fascinating. Um, there has not been a dull year. I came in um, at the end of the, uh, the Quinn administration in 2012 and we tackled enormous issues. We tackled uh, marriage equality and the pension crisis and concealed carry. And, and so every year it seems as though there's a new crisis. Of course, Governor Quinn lost to Governor Rauner and then the crisis became, can we govern at all? The great stalemate where Illinois went two and a half years without a budget as Governor Rauner refused to, to work with us on a budget. And, and, and so we had to fight back against all of his anti-union efforts. Um, finally got through that. Governor Pritzker comes in. We have a banner year once again. We pass all these major pieces of legislation and then the pandemic hits. So it, it's been a challenge. I mean, there hasn't been a dull year. Um, in, in, in fact, the the most interesting thing was that the, you know, the General Assembly is supposed to meet from January until the end of May. And the summer's off while the governor reviews the legislation and then sign it in, in, you know, we would come back for veto session in the fall. And it, was, it wasn't until the pandemic where there was actually a summer where I didn't have to go to Springfield. That was rare. You know, legislatures never went uh, during the summer, but every single year that I've served, We've been called into overtime into the summer, whether it was budget impasses or or dealing with important issues. We've always been drawn back in, so it's uh, it, it's it's been an adventure. It's been a, a singular honor to serve, and I I really enjoyed my time there. Of what are you most proud in your tenure, both in the House of Representatives and the State Senate? Um, I, I would say that um, two things stand out in in, in my tenure and. Um, the first is the way I approached the office. Um, uh, I am a unapologetic progressive. Um, I have strong beliefs about the way that I believe is the best path forward. But I've also approached the position with understanding that um, just because I think I'm right doesn't necessarily think that I doesn't mean that I am or that anyone else agrees with me. And so I have uh, worked very hard to be as bipartisan as possible. And, and that doesn't mean compromising what I believe in. It means giving respect to those people that have views that are different than mine. And so every piece of legislation, even those pieces where I knew that my conservative Republican friends would never vote for it, I pay them the respect of, of talking to them personally about every bill that I put forth. And as a result, other than one bill, Every bill I've ever passed has had broad bipartisan majorities, even bills that people thought wouldn't have them. Um, the only bill that didn't have a broad bipartisan majority was the fair tax resolution, which not surprisingly wouldn't have it since that was a partisan issue. Um, the most, imp uh, I think the most important piece of legislation that I passed that I'm most proud of was the, um, what we call the Unclaimed Life Insurance Benefits Act. And it's a long word salad name, but really what it did was it changed the law. In Illinois, law used to permit insurance companies to deny paying life insurance proceeds to beneficiaries if those beneficiaries did not proactively come forth and, and claim those benefits. They were under no obligation to notify them or tell them. And as a result, it was common practice that people would pay into life insurance their entire lives. They would die expecting this company to care for their beneficiaries. And the beneficiaries would use this loophole in the law to deny those benefits. We changed that law to require them to proactively notify beneficiaries so beneficiaries can claim, rightfully claim the money that they're owed. 
And this is uh, transferred $750 million, three quarters of a billion dollars from insurance companies to the people that were really supposed to be getting this benefit when their loved one died. And it's really great legislation. It makes a, a, a profound difference in people's lives. Um, but again, this is what I'm proud of because dovetailing back to the first thing I said, Governor Rauner vetoed this bill on behalf of the insurance lobby. And I had to go down uh, and pick up five votes and I picked up five Republican votes Republicans willing to override their own governor at the peak of his power because uh, I had a chance to explain to them that this was the right thing to do, that, that no one paid into a life insurance pro, uh, policy expecting that someday that that insurance company would deny those proceeds to the their loved ones. And so um, I was really proud of the work that we put in and the way that we were able to override the governor's veto and do good work for the people of Illinois. It's hard to imagine that um, the insurance companies had to be forced into this. It's uh, damning. Yeah, and kicking and screaming. Some of them, and to be fair, some of them um, came along quite willingly, whether that was because they saw the writing on the wall and they wanted to be the good actors at that point, despite 50 years, 60 years of practice. But some of them actually sued us to try and stop us from enforcing this rule because they admitted it was part of their business practice to deny proceeds to families. And, and this was particularly prevalent in minority communities, where, of course, they sort of expected that people would willingly pay their paycheck, but lose their paperwork or not tell their kids about it. And if they didn't come forward, they didn't have to make the claim. Well, thank you. Thank you on behalf of the people of Illinois. Yeah, I, one of the uh, pieces of legislation that you have been working on for some time is a change in the law regarding uh, the Board of Education in the city of Chicago. Why don't you tell us a little bit about that? Uh, yeah, it's a, an issue that I campaigned on back in 2012, and it's an issue that I really believe strongly in, which is the ability of every person in the city of Chicago to have a voice in the direction and an operation of their public schools, just like every other citizen in this state has in every other school district and every other corner of this state. In 1995, um, the Republican-controlled General Assembly and the Republican governor granted to the mayor of the city of Chicago authoritarian control. And just because a, a government is appointed does not necessarily make it bad, but the way that this government is structured, and I mean the governance of the Chicago public schools, the way it's structured in Chicago is, is just, it, it's wrong by every account. It is complete control by the mayor. There is no accountability um, or, or, or oversight from the legislative body. That doesn't exist in democracy. And as a result, there have been lots of decisions in, uh, that have been made by this hand-picked board by these mayors over the years. I, I could give you plenty of examples, but let me just give you the first one. In 1995, the, when this change took place, the Chicago Teacher Pension Fund was a 107% funded. And from 1995 to 2005, a decade, the, Chicago, the appointed Chicago Public School Board did not make a single payment into their pension system for a decade and drove that funded level from 107% funded down to the 48% that it currently sits today. Now, every single homeowner and taxpayer in the city of Chicago has to replenish those funds that were wasted if they would just would have been, payments would have been made timely. Um, now, could, could an elected board choose to do that, skip their pension payments? Sure. The Illinois General Assembly did it back in 2003 under government, Governor Blagojevich. But the people should have elected accountability. They should be able to go and exercise their voice through the course of democratic elections over the decisions that board makes, and they can't do it now. So I'm a, I'm a big believer in this. If there is one issue in the city of Chicago that every resident of the city of Chicago has an opinion on, it is the future of, of, of education and their children's education, and they should have a voice the way every the way we're supposed to in democracy. No taxation without representation. It's a cornerstone of our system. You know, I think that many residents in Chicago may not be aware that only in Chicago is there a school board that's not elected. As a former teacher, it's uh, it's an issue clearly that 
that I'm concerned about and share your view that the residents of the city of Chicago ought to have an opportunity to elect uh, the head, the, the, the members of their board of education, just as, as folks do everywhere else in the state. So um, as, a, as a progressive person, uh, what are you looking for from the Biden-Harris administration? Oh, well, um, obviously the 180 degree turn that was promised from the Trump administration, um, you know, clearly from a policy perspective, I, I really want to see us get back on track with um, health care being a human right and not a privilege. Um, I want to see our environment, uh, us make legitimate efforts to, to uh, stop the, the downward spin of, of, of the damage that we're doing to our environment and start preserving it for my kids and my kids' kids um, down the line. Um, and I, I'm really hoping that um, we start to address um, economic disparity, something that we've talked about for for so long um, and yet year after year after year we see this widening wealth gap in our country and I think it is so destructive to us as a society uh, as a democracy to have this just these uh, this massive chasm between the uber wealthy and everyone else and uh, uh, so I'm hoping that we can institute some policies that that better create for a better dispersion of, of, of income and a, a more access to economic opportunity. I'm not one of these people who believes that you can create stuff out of thin air. I believe that there is a limited pool of resources. And when a few group, a few small uh, people get to take up the whole pool, then there's nothing left for everyone else. We, we can't have access to opportunity unless that pool has got enough uh, in it for everyone. And so, so that's what I'm hoping for. Um, and of course, most importantly, I'm, I'm really above all, really above all, I'm hoping that we have a return to normalcy, we have a return to civility, we have a return to uh, respect for the process, for the institution of democracy, and those who serve it, whether you agree with them or you disagree with them, we, we return to some sort of a respect and dignity uh, so that I can once again look to our, our capital as a, a place that, that I have the respect for it, that I, I was taught to have while I was growing up. Well, thank you. I think that's a good place to conclude our, our interview. We thank you for joining us today for our podcast, The 80. And we wish you luck in the session in, in Springfield, of course, and, and share your hopes for the Biden-Harris administration. Thank you very much, Rob. Thank you so much for having me. It was great to be with you.